All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, I am very excited to welcome you all here today. We have a very special guest um, for you who came here and is gonna be giving a talk to you guys and talking a lot about his journey and some advice that he has for you. Um, and so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask um, somebody who's very special to our special guest, Ms. Carmen Sanders, our campus administrator here at King Street to come do an introduction. Thank you, Principal Ballas. Um, so as uh, Mr. Ballas stated that this student is very near and dear to my heart as well as his family, and I see some of his former teachers that are out here in the crowd. And so, um, as NOAA's Dean of Students for the class of 2016, we developed a very close relationship, and so when I see him succeed, it makes me extremely proud. And so I'm not going to um, belabor the hour. I am going to introduce uh, Mr. Noah Lyles, gold medalist, and his awesome momager, Mrs. Keisha Bishop. Come on. <laughs> Hi, guys, how are you? Great. Well, I am Noah's mommy, and <laughs> Ms. Sanders asked me to introduce him. So a lot of you guys were very young when he went here. We feel very old now. He graduated in 2016. Noah and his brother ran track here. He also has some of the same teachers you have, like Mr. Shabazz and Ms. Jones. But I thought it would be great for us to come back to the high school. And I said, Noah, what if we go stop by Alexandria City High School and let them know about your journey? Because everybody only sees the TV commercials and the Olympic medals and the fancy cars and the fancy house. But there are a lot of obstacles to overcome along the way. So Noah's gonna share his journey. We do this as part of our nonprofit, the Lyles Brothers Sports Foundation. And in sharing his journey, I want you to listen to the obstacles he's had to overcome and how he overcame them. And think about yourself, because each of you has a gift, and it might not be running, and that's okay. But whatever your gift is, figure out what it is and do everything you can to be the best at it. And then at the end, we'll come back and do some questions and answers. So here's Noah. Can we get a clap for the momager over there? <laughs> yeah, Def big shout out to my mom. Like every time, I, d I definitely wouldn't be here without her. And I, first of all, I just like to thank the administration and everybody. And you know, well, it's not called T.C. Williams anymore. That's crazy to me. <laughs> but uh, everybody who helped out and let me come out here and just speak. And uh, thanks for all of you for uh, listening, to be honest, because I know, you know, you go through school and it's probably boring. You know, I didn't like school. I'm going to just say that. <laughs> Not a big fan. But, uh, you know, I made it through. <laughs> but uh, like my mom said, you know, I came out here and I was part of the 2016 class. And, you know, I, I feel like our biggest thing was, you know, we, we made athletes in our, our year and we had leaders. And when we, uh, I remember in uh, my junior, uh, sophomore year, we won states in the soccer and in track and field, and that was a huge thing. You know, we were all flexing our rings when we were walking around. But uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we, we had a lot of fun. But um, as I got older, I was like, you know, I, you know, I didn't want to go to college. You know, I wanted to go pro. So I decided I had a dream, and I was going to go after it, and I made it happen. Me and my brother, we went pro out of high school. We became the first male athlete sprinters to ever go pro out of high school. So automatically, you know, we decided that we were going to do something that, you know, hadn't been done before. And uh, it's hard, you know. <laughs> You're going up against history, but we knew that we can do it. We had a great team. You know, talked about my mom. We had, you know, massage therapists, chiropractors, and a lot of other people who were just in our corner to help us get to that. And as we kept going up, you know, we kept going against things that, you know, history said hadn't been done before. And that's never really been an issue. But as you start getting higher and higher, you start going through a lot of challenges. And that's when, you know, mental health starts coming in. So, of course, I'm a big advocate for mental health. I've truthfully been in therapy since 
oh gosh, I was eight years old. Uh, I'm just put it like this. You probably have your kids who are in the, you know, what the, the special classes, they struggle with learning a little more than others. You know, they struggle with reading, spelling, all that. Yeah, that was me. I, I was in all those classes. Yeah, that, that was definitely me. Uh, I, had, I was the kid who had the different spelling tests from everybody else. You know, the teacher would go out and she'd be telling everybody the words. He'd be like, all right, your word is, you know, I don't know, school. And she'd come up to me and said, was. And I'd be over here thinking, gosh darn it, how the heck am I going to spell was? <laughs> It's the hardest word in existence. <laughs> now, you can definitely laugh. It, it's okay. I'm perfectly fine with it now. But, uh, yeah, I have ADD and dyslexia. So, of course, being in therapy was very important from a young age. So I would go on, and as I got older, you know, I was like, you know, I feel like I can handle this a little more. And when we finally got to about high school, me and my brother were like, we want to go to the 2016 Olympics, and we want to go out and make the team, and we want to be pros and all this, and we had decided that we needed a sports therapist because we were going up against history. We had to say, hey, if we're going to do this, we need to make sure that our mind is correct, and that was pretty much our first introductory to it, and I'm going to skip a lot <laughs> right now. We're going to go all the way up into 2020. And 2020 was hard. I think everybody here can agree with that, you know, going with COVID. Uh, we had the Black Lives Movement happening at the same time. And, you know, that hit me very hard. Along, right about in April, you know, you start seeing a lot more deaths, a lot more, you know, just innocent black people dying for reasons that you would think are very simple that they should be living. And I have accumulated a platform over the years. You know, I've worked on my social media, but a lot of people, you'll see influencers now, and they'll be having hundreds of thousands of followers, and I never thought that would be me, but it turns out it was. So now, you know, I have the blue check and followers out the wazoo and everybody's supporting, and I'm like, okay, I know how this platform, and I want to do something with it, but, you know, it was hard for me to decide what I wanted to do, and at the same time, I couldn't go outside, and I couldn't be, enjoy being with my friends. I couldn't have those exciting, you know, parties, you know, some people want to go out and drink and go clubbing when they're older and all that. You know, I couldn't do that because, one, I had to try to figure out how I was going to train, which now, instead of training on a track, I was training in a park in the middle of the grass with, you know, your, your joggers and your bikers and your dog walkers, and that was really different. <laughs> it's really weird when you're trying to do extremely athletic things and somebody just comes down with their dog, oh, look at that. <laughs> They all look like they're having fun. It's like, no, we're, we're training for the Olympics. It, anyway, <laughs> we, um, it, it, it was a really hard time, and I started to feel like I wasn't myself. And my mom came down one time in, in March, and she was like, you don't look like yourself. And I was like, yeah, I don't feel like myself. Uh, I wasn't talking as much. A lot of people who know me closely know I'm very energetic. Um, I'm really, you know, conversating. I love to talk to people. I love to be out, be active. You know, if they see me race and they see me before, you know, I run a track meet or I run a race, I'm super energetic. I, inter you know, I'm interacting with the camera. I'm, I'm doing funny things, you know, just being me. But I didn't feel like I could be that anymore, you know. I didn't want to be in the conversation. I just wanted to be, like, in the back. Maybe sometimes I didn't even want to, you know, engage in it. And that was really weird that my mom was like, you know, that doesn't seem like Noah. And at this time, I was already talking to my sports, th or my sports therapist, and I already had a personal therapist because I believe that just because, you know, you have a sports therapist, I, I still got to have things in my own life that I got to, you know, take care of in my mental health. So after a few conversations with my normal therapist, she was like, you know what, I think it might be time to go on medication. And I was like, you know what, I think you're right. And at first I was scared to admit that because I didn't want a different personality. You know, a lot of people think that if you take the medication, it's going to change you. But what really happens when you take the medication is it's actually helping you release the hormones that your body would naturally use, that you would naturally feel happy and, you know, sad, but also excited. And right now, my body wasn't producing that. So the medication isn't actually changing my, you know, behavior or anything like that. It's actually helping it be normal and what it would normally be. And that's a big misconception that, one, I just wanted to, you know, come out here and tell everybody that if you are feeling depressed and somebody says medication, you know, don't be scared, you know. 
uh, after I got on the medication, I started being able to go back to training a lot more happy, uh, a lot more excited. I, I felt like it was me again. I felt like a whole um, almost rock was just lifted off of my chest, and every day didn't seem like a dull, depressing day. It was now an exciting day that I got to do new things and have fun and be me and go through my exciting life because I have a fun life, and it was very sad that I felt that I couldn't enjoy that. Uh, of course, we go through the rest of 2020, you know, they postponed the Olympics, and we're like, okay, now we got to change our ideas. Now we got to move towards 2021, and we start the 2021 season, and it's now year 2021, and we're like, okay, we're getting ready for the Olympics. Uh, we've been told there's going to be no fans. Okay, that's different, because I'm a guy who loves to interact with the fans. All right, we're going to be told that everybody has to have, you know, COVID tests. Oh, wow. You got to get the vaccine. Okay, that's not so bad. But if you get COVID and you have the vaccine, you're still going to get quarantined. Wow, that's a huge risk. So if I still get the vaccine, it doesn't mean anything. That's correct. Wow, that's crazy. I feel like I'm getting set up here. <laughs> but even with that risk, we went over there and we were able to perform. But before that, I still had to go through the whole season. I was training. And I wasn't feeling like myself, you know. Uh, I'm on the medication. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, you know, doing better than I was a few months ago. But I'm kind of getting beat by some people in my group that I shouldn't be losing to. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to just shrug it off. And, you know, it's just, you know, the beginning of the season, you know, we got tons of season left. We start getting to the middle of the season, and I'm like, okay, I'm still getting beat by some people I don't need to be getting beat by. And I'm just like... Something's not right here. I start scratching my head. I'm, I'm talking to my sports therapist. I'm talking to my regular therapist. And, and I'm, I'm like, I, something don't add up. I'm doing all the math, and the math ain't working. Now, granted, I'm not that great at math, but I can do this math. It's not working. And we just kind of came to the idea that the medication's job is to keep me in a neutral zone. It helps me not be depressed, so down at the bottom, so around a you know, a 10 and a 20, but it helps me stay in between that 50 and 65 area of excitement. But when I'm training and I'm trying to be, you know, my authentic Noah, I'm up here at, you know, a 90, 95, 100, and I wasn't getting that anymore. So I had to make the really tough decision and say, okay, I have to come off this medication. But at the same time, I had to make sure that I was doing the work outside with my therapist to make sure that I don't have a relapse, that I don't go back to that depressive point that I was in, that I'm not struggling like I, how I was before I got on it. And that's when the most work came in. Because when I started coming off of it, I still was gradually getting better and I was starting to see that, that Noah that I've used to see, but it still wasn't there, you know? I, I wasn't extremely confident and now everybody is running faster than they've run in previous years and we go to the Olympic trials and I'm still not there, you know? Everybody saw this Noah who is the fourth fastest ever to live. And they're like, we're going to get that Noah. And fans are like, oh, yeah, you're going to break the world record and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I love my fans, but that's pressure. You know, putting all that pressure on somebody, that, that was a one-time thing. And I'm trying to make it into a multiple-time thing. But that's a lot of pressure to put on one person. And they don't understand that. And that's okay. But it's my job to know that I do the work for my mental health to know that I can handle that pressure. So as we get into the Olympic trials, I go out there and I won the 200, but I don't think I won that day because I was trying hard, like super hard. I actually had to talk to myself and be like, hey, you know, everybody's putting this pressure on you, but right now just calm down, like just be you, just relax. And my, my coach, he's a very old school coach, you know, he's about that aggression. You know, if you, you've ever got a football coach, you know, he's more of a football coach than I would say a track coach. He'd come on, I need you to you know, rip off the blocks and you, you need to attack everybody and destroy everybody. And I was like, but what if I didn't? What if I kind of just like was more loose with it and just gradually passed everybody? Well, uh, I guess you could do that too. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. As long as you win, I don't care what you do, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, as I did that, I felt my mental state relaxing. I felt my body relaxing. And I was able to actually come out and win and run the fastest time I had that year. And from there, you know, there was a, a, a light load just coming off. And I felt like, you know, yeah, I'm getting back to my old self. So then we go to Tokyo. And I'll tell you what, Tokyo was even harder. 
And it was harder because I didn't have my support system there. And a, a lot of people will probably say that they don't have a support system. But to be honest, you probably do. Your friends, your parents, you know, teachers, coaches, those are your support system. And when you take that away, it becomes a lot harder. You know, I, I've, of course, I've done the work and I've gone and, you know, I have these skills and tricks that I can use by myself. But when I look back at Tokyo, I'm just like, wow, it could have been so much easier if they were there. You know, if I had my mom, if I had my own personal massage therapist, if I had my chiropractor or my uh, sports therapist, this could have been way easier. And it was hard, but I had to get through that myself because I refused to let my emotions destroy me. I refused to go into a, a race or a situation where my emotions are just bubbling up and I can't control them because then I feel weak. I, I hate it when I get really angry and I can't put my emotions in check because then I feel like a weaker person. And a lot of people is like, well, no, I just use those emotions. But if your emotions aren't checked, then you won't put them in the right area of your life. You can't drive them in the right direction. They're just free flowing everywhere, and they're just la latching out and attacking everything. So if you can't control your emotions, then what are they for? So I'm hugely into, I have to put all my energy in the right direction. And at Tokyo, I felt that I did a decent job, but I didn't do my best job. And a lot of people will come up to me and say, you got the bronze medal at the Olympics. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and like, aren't you excited? No, I'm not. I'm actually kind of pissed because <laughs> uh, I was going out there for gold. And I have a mental idea that I'm going to be the best no matter what. And what hurt even more was even though the people who beat me had to PR, I didn't PR. I didn't run my fastest. I knew that I could run faster that day. And it just sucked that I didn't get to show it. So I was upset. And, but I still got the medal, and, you know, I'm grateful for that. But then my agent came up to me, and he said, I want you to run again. And I'm like, I don't want to run. I don't want to run. I just want to end the season. I want to be done. It's over. Let's just close this chapter of my life, move on to the next four years. He's like, no, 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 no. I want you to run again. I said, I'll think about it, because I don't like to give quick answers, you know. I want to be able to give the real thought to it. So... I go back to my mom, and my mom was like, I think you should run. And I'm like, I don't want to run. And I was like, okay, if you guys really think that I should run, let me first sit down with my sports therapist, and let's have a talk with her. And she tells me, I think you should run. And I'm like, why is everybody telling me they think I should run? I don't want to run no more. I'm tired of running. She said, I want you to run because I think you're scared. Me? I'm not scared. See, that's what the real Noah would say. But I think you're scared. You know what? You might be right. I might be scared. And I might be letting my emotions control me right now. And like I said, when I realized that, I don't like that. So now I want to be able to stomp out my emotions and letting it drive my life. And she says, let's debrief Tokyo. Let's take Tokyo for what it was. We got a gold medal, or we got a bronze medal. We went out there, we ran. You didn't PR, but you still ran good. You're in great shape. Let's forget about that. Right now, you're pissed from that. And I'm like, you're, you're dang right I am. <laughs> Let's take that emotion and use it for your next race. Forget about everybody else. Forget about your sponsors. Forget about, you know, all the people who want you to run fast. Just run for you. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to run for me. And when I finally went out there and started training for myself, I ended up getting as close as I could to my PR. My PR is 1950, which is the fourth fastest time for any human being, and I ran 1952, which again would have been the fourth fastest time if I didn't run faster than that. <laughs> but I finally got to a point where I'm like, okay, I feel good. I feel ready. I feel like myself again. And now going into 2022, where we have world championships in Oregon, I feel like I can show up in front of America and say, hey, I'm the guy who's going to win the gold medal. But I don't think I would have been able to do that if I didn't constantly work on my mental health. And I just, of course, wanted to tell you all of this because, one, I believe that mental health isn't just for sports. Because, as I said, a lot of things in my personal life affected my sports life. But also because 
everybody needs mental health. And the more you understand about yourself is when you'll start understanding the world a lot more. A lot of people will come up and they'll be like, you know, you know they'll try to give you advice and all this other stuff. And if it's, it's I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> if it's not professional advice, I only would take it with a hint of salt. My mom says something that's really, really important. She just told me this, but I'm gonna I'm a take it right now. She said, if you wouldn't want to trade life, your life with that person who's giving you that advice, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> But I'm going to stop talking now because I don't want you guys to get bored because you guys have probably been sitting for a while. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you guys have learned something. And now I believe my mom's going to come up. We can answer any questions that you have, any at all. And if it has to do with anime, I'd want you to hear it even more. <laughs> All right, students, here's what's going to happen now for the Q&A portion. We have a microphone up here for you to come ask a question. Um, you can, if you have a question, raise your hand. Mr. Parker is going to come around and let you know that you can come up here to the microphone, okay? So just to let you guys know, um, some of the questions you got, the reason we do this together is because sometimes when Noah answers a question, it's more from the athlete student perspective. And so I hear it more from the adult parent perspective and I know that there are teachers and caregivers in here. So we just like to share some of our answers from two different perspectives. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name's Aaliyah. Um, so over the 2020 or the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, uh, Simone Biles. Uh, could you just step a little closer to the yeah, mic? Sorry. Um, for the 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympics, so Simone Biles dropped out uh, for mental health reasons. What do you think about that, and do you recommend it for other athletes or other people in general? So I actually have a lot of respect for Simone Biles. I actually know her personally, and she's, one, an amazing person. And two, you know, she goes out there and she performs to the best of her abilities. And it's very hard to understand that you're not in a shape to mentally compete, it's very hard, it's even harder to accept that you need to not do something to be able to live another day, <laughs> uh, basically. I myself have had to pull out of a lot of competitions where I could have won a lot of money, a, a lot of money, but I knew that my career would be longer if I didn't run that day. And one, it, it's, it's very hard to do that. So I have a lot of respect for her being able to say that, one, at the Olympics, and then two, at all. And um, I, I think that probably was the best decision for her, you know, knowing, one, that she knew what was going on in her body, and then two, being able to verbalize it. I agree with Noah, with um, Simone Biles. I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is when you see the athlete there are like 10 people that stand behind that athlete. You guys only see them for a few minutes on TV, but to get them to that spot, to being on TV to compete, they have had a chef, they've had a chiropractor, they've had a massage therapist, they've had a physiotherapist, they've had a sports psychologist, they have an agent, they have a coach, and they have a manager. So in Tokyo, Simone Biles said that every time she competes, she turns and looks at her mom right before she starts and there were no fans allowed. And I think her not having her mom there and that support system, it affected so many people. Because like I said, it's not just the athlete, it is the whole team. So I think she definitely made the right decision. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jordan, I'm a senior. And uh, my question is, when did you first realize that you and your family, that you will be a star in track, and what drives you to be a better version of yourself every day? Shoot, when did I realize? Uh, so I actually did, did a bunch of sports before I found track and field. Uh, I did basketball, I did soccer, baseball, swimming, gymnastics. Gymnastics was actually probably going to be the sport that 
I would have went to the Olympics if it wasn't for track. But when I got about, I want to say 12, that's when I started doing track and field. And I actually wasn't the fastest. I was a high jumper. So I just jumped really high. And I was like, oh, shoot, you know, I'm really good at this. And this kind of goes into the reason why I, you know, thrive to keep competing is I realized that I could be the best at something. Not just the best at something, the best one in the state, then two in a region, then three in the nation. And then eventually I found a world stage that I can compete at. And I'd be like, well, I could do that too. So as I kept growing up, I was like, oh, I could keep being the best at something. Like, I want to be the best. And if I saw the path to being able to obtain that, I was going to take it or I was going to create it myself. So as I got into, shoot, my eighth grade year, I went to Junior Olympics and me and my brother watched the 2012 opening ceremonies at the Olympics. And right there, we decided that we were going to make the 2016 team. And we ran with it. You know, we told our mom here, and she was like, you know, I don't know if it's going to come true, but I'll give you all the resources I can to make it come true. And me and my brother did the work. And from there, we were able to get to the Olympic trials. I actually got fourth, and they take top three. So I missed the 2016 team by one spot. Uh, I actually broke the high school ne national record on that day as well. And then Adidas said, hey, we want to sign you and your brother. So that was kind of another point where it's like, okay, I'm in the right direction, you know. And ever since then, I'm just like, I know I can be the best at this. And that's what keeps me driving. Hey, no, what's up, man? What's up? <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Aldo. Actually, I, I mean, you mentioned that you play soccer, right? I actually play for TC soccer team. Okay. And let's be honest, man, athlete to athlete. What do you think is the best thing that you did during high school that actually made you succeed? Like, let's say you, you follow like a, a strict schedule or like you had like a mentality that look, I'm gonna get that. Or like, what, what did you follow basically? What do you think that is the thing that made you succeed? I got a question for mama too after that. <laughs> I'm actually gonna have my mom chime in on this question <laughs> because it, it, it was definitely a team effort thing. Uh, one, I had a really, really good support team. Uh, me, my mom, my brother, we gained a chiropractor, we gained a sports therapist, we gained a massage therapist, and we were very, you know, we, we were very strict on the schedule of how often we got it, and always knowing what our greater plan was. Our greater plan was to be ready to go and make the Olympic team in 2016. It wasn't to win states, it wasn't to win nationals, it wasn't, you know, if, to win world juniors or world youths. Of course, those were nice things that we picked up along the way, but it was really all to prepare us for getting to the Olympic team and making sure that we would be ready. So there were times where we were like, hey, you know, my mom would be cooking us, <laughs> you know, uh, meals with two vegetables. And we were like, why are we eating two vegetables? He's like, because you just depleted all your energy, so you need to make it back up. Fair enough. <laughs> And, uh, of course, there were times where we were taking very long drives um, up all the way to, what, uh, shoot, the top of Maryland. So two-hour drives up and then two hours back to just to get a massage. After school. After school. <laughs> and then, of course, we still had to keep up with our studies, which was very hard for me. <laughs> but, again, my mom was very diligent in making sure that I would keep up with that. Uh, Mom, would you have anything to add to that? No, I think you did a good job. It it really is. If you can find somebody in your corner, like everybody doesn't have a a parent that can do that, or but if you can find a coach, or you can find Miss Sanders, or you like you somebody. When people see that you're willing to put in the work, somebody will invest in you. And I think that was it. Like um, there were times when he and his brother couldn't finish their homework, so Miss Sanders. And I had a whole team meeting, and um, he was just struggling to stay up to do his homework some night. So I would say, okay, well, if you can't do your homework, I'll do your chores for you that night. I will wash the dishes. I'll do this. Because if so we're a team. So if somebody on the team needs help, we step up as a family. We help the team. And that's just our whole concept to life. Together, everyone achieves more, a team. So we are, we are a team. So look for your team. 
now to the question for Mama. So, uh, I mean, you came to my point. I was going to ask that, uh, let's say you have a suggestion for our parents. You know, let's say that our parents are right here. What would you tell them to support us? Say that again, I'm sorry. I was saying that, imagine that our parents are right here now. What would you tell them so they can do something that they can support us as an athlete and as students? Like, what did you do for Noah during that time so that they can do for us? Yeah, Noah just gave me a good suggestion. Um, sometimes I find that parents, teachers, uh, people who support you as you move up the ranks, they stop becoming parents and caregivers and teachers, and they become fans. And you don't need a fan. You need somebody that says, when you have a bad day of practice, if you're injured, if you are really struggling, you can walk in this room or in this house and know that I still care about you because of you. Even if the sport is taken away and you can't do the sport anymore, you're still precious to me because just of who you are. And then whenever, whatever you need help with as the athlete or the student, communicate that. Like sometimes we think we have to deal with it all by ourselves, but I don't think we were created to do everything by ourselves. We all need each other because, you know, you probably have a gift that I don't have. My daughter is a biochemistry major in college. And I tell her, Abby, if you get stuck on a test, you just call me. I don't have a clue what the answer is, but you just call me and I will support you. <laughs> Sometimes you just need that support. So let people know what you need. Hey, Noah. Hey, you, we got to see you around at TC, though. We got so to see, see you raising at TC. You got to uh, raise somebody. Unfortunately, I don't got a whole for track free anymore. Team here. <laughs> hi there. My name hi. is... Oh, hi. My name's Chloe, and I'm a sophomore, and I'm from Theogony with the student newspaper. And my question is kind of for both of you, I guess. But how is it... What is it like to work so closely with your family, like with running with your brother and the foundation with your, the rest of your family? I enjoy being with my family. You know, uh, if we didn't have sports, if we didn't you know, have you know, the organization, I just hang out with them just because. And I think that's really the root of why we enjoy working together so much, that we just have fun as a family and all together. We each have our own gifts and we know that. And anytime one of us has a idea or a business plan, you know, we all chip in what we think we could do to support that. And, you know, having fun is my whole life's, you know, goal. You know, I'm, I'm not up, I don't run track because I want to make money. I run track because I have fun with it. You know, whatever I do in life, I do because I have fun with it. Thank you. Um, my name is Wisdom. I'm a senior this year, and um, I do track and field. And right now I'm going through recruiting processes with some colleges. So I was just wondering if there's any college things that you regret not being able to experience since you went so pro so young. Oh, this is definitely a mom question. This, my mom loves this question. Because we, even though we didn't go to college, we still went through the whole process. We even signed to the University of Florida. So we have a huge structure on how to handle colleges. So you said you're an athlete? Yeah, I do track and field as well. So, and what year are you, a senior? Yes. Yeah, so we have something that we call a matrix, and I'm actually doing a training on that um, in October, but we have certain things that we recommend student athletes look for when they're looking at colleges. So a lot of times people go to what I call designer schools. They wanna go to Alabama, Florida, Ohio State, Michigan, but that might not be the school for you. So I always recommend that you look at a couple of things, like you write down what is important to you as a student athlete. Um, it might be the dorms, it might be the food in the cafeteria, it might be having a good training room, because sometimes when you go to a big university, the football team gets taken care of by the trainers before track and field is a non-revenue sport. They're gonna take care of the sports that make money before they take care of the Olympic sports. So those are just some of the things that you wanna look at. And I'll also, if, um, do you know Ms. Sanders or Mr. Ba okay, so I'll make sure you get the information um, on the upcoming 
program that we're going to do. It's going to be like a two-night Zoom call, and it should be a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Dima, and my question is, have you ever uh, watched any, like, shows? And if you do, then what are they? I'm, I'm sorry, the, the mask is... Oh, all cartoons. <laughs> well, my favorite TV show is The Office, by far. I have every episode downloaded on my phone, so I'm never without it. And uh, I'm, I'm really into anime, almost every cartoon. Uh, I remember when the season finale of Steven Universe went on, and I was in Europe, and I almost cried watching it before my track race, and people were like, what, what are you getting all teary-eyed for? I was just like, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> But uh, I'm hugely also into anime, uh, so I, I watch a lot of that. And then, you know, of course, your your American Dads, your, your South Parks, your Family Guys, pretty big into that. Uh, a lot of so a lot of um, the TV that goes on in my house is mainly just cartoons. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you could go a bit more in depth about like how depression and antidepressants affected your physical well-being. More in depth about how depression what? How depression and antidepressants like affected his well-being. Actual medicine. I mean, how yeah, well yeah, physical, physical well-being. Your physical body. So to be honest, I think this is more of my mom's question because she's actually been on medication longer than I have. Um, right now, I'm actually off of it, and when I first got off of it, on it, uh, my body responds very quickly to medication. So I felt instantly that it was working. Uh, I basically took it every day for, for at least, I want to say eight, nine months. And while I was on it, it felt like, you no, know, truthfully, it didn't feel like anything had changed in me. It, I felt like I was happier that every day, you know, I would just go outside and, and I could be excited. You know, I didn't feel like there was a cap on my emotions anymore. But again, to be honest, I think this is really more my mom's question. Yeah, so what I noticed before the medication, um, so in men, and I'm not a doctor, just to let you know, but in men, um, depression shows up differently. It shows up as anger, as rage. Um, you might have some uncontrollable crying. In women, you'll see more of the uncontrollable crying, feeling overwhelmed, not being able to handle everyday things. So when I picked Noah up from the airport when I flew to Florida to see him, I saw the rage, like we will be at a stoplight and he's honking at the horn, the car in front of us. And I said, the light just turned green. He's like, well, they just need to go because I've got to go somewhere. And I'm like, we're just going home. Where are we going? And he had been telling me for a really long time that he felt overwhelmed because Adidas needed him to do this and Coke needed him to do that and Visa wanted him and Xfinity wanted him. And I said, but this was our dream to have all these sponsors, but he just couldn't wake up and handle one more thing. So those are some of the signs. Now, the way it works, the medication is your body produces hormones like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. So the best way I can describe it is let's say serotonin is the hormone that helps you handle stress. So let's say you wake up, you hear your cell phone ring, you answer your cell phone. Serotonin shoots through your brain and absorbs your, in your body to help you handle the stress of answering the phone. But you don't think answering the phone is stressful because it wasn't a big deal. But if the serotonin is not getting through in your body, it will be stressful. So when you take the medication, it helps your body absorb what you need. Did that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I like your hair. Um, hi. My name is Yanni Marie, and I'm a sophomore. I'm with Theogony, our school newspaper. I'm sorry. I, I can't hear, guys. Thank you. Hi. My name is Yanni Marie, um, and I'm a sophomore with our school's new pa newspaper, uh, Theogony. So you mentioned briskly that during 2020, especially June 2020 and that summer, there's a large focus on the Black Lives Matter movement and that sort of conversation. As someone with the platform at the time, what was it like working with brands and were there any social things that changed in the industry? And like, what was your response to that? How did you stay grounded amidst, you know, these sort of intervening pressures of your athletic career as well as what was happening in the country at the time? All right, I'm gonna repeat the question because it is hard to hear. Uh, I think what you're asking is, 
being an athlete, working with huge companies, and being you know a black man, how did I deal with all those companies and still trying to push my agenda? Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Yeah, that's a really good question, to be honest. It, and it's, first of all, it's not easy because you never know how people will react. And I think it's when you start not caring about how other people react is when you can start finding yourself to be more free to do things. Um, I truthfully had to sit down with myself and say, you know what? I don't care if the companies don't like what I have to say because in actuality, if that's how it is, they're probably gonna get more press about you know being a bad company than I will about you know losing money and somebody you know will come up. And I think you really have to think about you know. I thought a lot about Colin Kaepernick in those moments because he literally said that his agenda was bigger than making money or playing football, and that's something that he loved to do. And I was like, if he can sacrifice that for what he believed was right, then I feel like I can do the same thing. And I just felt that I had too big of a platform to not say something. You know, By not saying something, I felt that I wasn't helping or pushing the conversation forward. I remember watching a lot of Jay-Z interviews, and in one interview, he said that pushing the conversation was the most important thing. You know, even though, you know, somebody might be radical at it, the conversation is now here. We're not ignoring it anymore. And I felt that, you know, there are people who are going to push it in one way, and there's going to be me who pushes it in another. But the most important thing was I felt that the conversation was pushed so that we could, you know, not be talking in silence or talking in the back corner. Like, now it's in the forefront. We all have to, you know, atone for it, and now we, now we have to all talk about it. You know, it's not something that's a secret anymore. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what he said. Before Noah made a public statement about what was going on with um, the police brutality in our country, we had a conversation because we wanted to make sure that we didn't alienate ourselves from some people who might agree with our view but didn't agree with the way we expressed our view. Um, because you can be right in your message, but you could say the message the wrong way. So we had to come up with a balance of how we were going to do this. We did agree that he might lose some of his sponsors, and we said we might lose some money. And, and I said, you know, I support you. We talked to his agent about the message we were going to do. So we found the right balance for us. Now, we're not putting down other people who choose to use their platform in a different way. We just found the right balance for us. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Max. Um, I'm a sophomore. I'm from the Theogony as well. And I was wondering, um, like, how do you, like, balance, like, with, like, practice? Like, when you get injured or when you have, like, issues with that, like, how do you make sure that you're not overworking yourself, but you're also getting in enough practice? What's your sport? I do cross country. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, for all athletes, being in tune with your body is probably the most important thing. And a lot of athletes aren't in tune with their body. And what I mean when I say that is, you know the difference between you being sore and you being hurt by something is like really trying to pull or something feels painful and something you just out of breath or you're just tired from the workout and you feel lactic acid. Um, also learning more about the body I feel is always important and being very vocal with your coach, another thing that it has to be done because you have to come back slowly. It's just every doctor in the world is going to say, you'll be back in six weeks. I promise you that's not the real answer. The real answer is going to be longer than that. If you truly want to come back healthier than before and not see the injury come back again, it's going to take longer than six weeks. And that's because when you do get injured, one, your body is going to pick up, the, the, your other healthy part of your body is going to pick up the slack that the injury is taking on. 
So that part is going to get stronger, but it's also going to take on more stress. So then when you finally start getting the, the injury back to health, you're like trying to get it back to a medium to so where your body is, you know, focused. And then you finally have to start working it even better than before. So again, being in tune and being slow to that process is very important. And in high school, it's, you know, very easy to get injured. But I feel this is the, we probably have the most time to get back into shape because at the end of the day, colleges really only care about your last season performance. So if you can, you know, if you get injured you, your sophomore year, but you take two years to get back and you have an amazing season in your senior year, that's all the ca colleges care about. They all, and they're not going to be looking at your junior performance where you didn't run. They're not going to be looking at your freshman performance. They're only going to be looking at your last recorded race performance, all of that. And it's just very important to know what your body is going through. Thank you. And we can refer you to somebody um, to help you with overcoming injuries too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, this is in general. I'm not injured currently, but I have been. <laughs> thank God. I have yeah, been before, thank God. We hate injuries. <laughs> all right, we have one, time for one more question. Uh, my name is Melanie. I'm a sophomore, and I was wondering if you could give us the real life experience. You know, like do a suicide run or a lap across the stage. I'm I'm I, sorry, guys. I cannot hear her. Thank you. I said, uh, can you give us the real life experience and do like a lap or a suicide run across the stage for us, please? What did she say, Mr. Parker? A suicide run or a lap across the stage. I think she wants you to like yeah, run like across run, the you know? stage or do a suicide or something. <laughs> we have what? some videos can we can show you. <laughs> I mean, unless you got twenty thousand dollars, I don't run for free. <laughs> oh, but you can't just give us the real life experience. I mean, you're not gonna see how fast I am just by like, running across the stage. So <laughs> the really funny thing, the really funny thing about track. Um, and we went through this when he was doing a commercial in California, is most people think you can just get up and run. It takes like an hour to two hours to warm up, <laughs> to run. I, I wasn't asking for anything like super professional. I was just asking because that would be a really cool experience for me. Uh, all, no, he could get injured like that. Like... Yeah, I'm not trying to get injured for the next year. Uh, well, thank you guys. Um, Just to let All you right, know. ladies and gentlemen, before we dismiss you, I'm just going to ask um, if Noah's got any closing comment or advice for you, and then when we're done, you're going to be going to your next period. Anything you like, it doesn't have to be. All right, guys, so we're going to close, but first of all, we want to thank you guys for coming, and I just want to let you know if you had a question or if you weren't able to get something in, that Noah will be here tonight at 7 o'clock, and he's going to have his Olympic medal, and he's going to be doing autographs, and he's going to be doing selfies. So if you guys want to come back and experience that, that's fine. But we just want to thank you guys for coming, and we hope you definitely got something out of it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>